Okay. Perfect. So thank you for joining us today for the Girl Scout Health and Wellbeing Zoom covering the steps of the Senior Women's Health Badge requirements. Um, let's start with the promise and the law. Landon, can you lead us through that, please? And put your three fingers up. Yep. On my honor, I will try to serve God in my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, and responsible for what I say and do, and to respect myself and others, respect authorities, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be a sister to every Girl Scout. Thank you, Landon. I appreciate that. All right, perfect. So we are so fortunate today to have Miss Sarah Pyland with us today. She is a holistic health coach and she owns her own company called Happy Camper Coaching. She is here to talk to us about all things health and well being for women specifically. And um, Sarah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me here today. I'm so excited to be here. We're excited to have you. Good. Well, let's just dive right in then. So let's start off here. The first question we have is, what is a certified health coach? What does it mean and what do you do? So a certified health coach is someone who has gone through a certification program and works with people to create healthy habits, achieve health goals, and find what works and what doesn't work for each person. The cool thing about health coaches is we work with the whole person. So instead of focusing just on what you eat and how you work out, we take into consideration all aspects of, of your life and your health. So when I work with someone, I'm not just gonna come in and say, you need to work out this many times a week and you need to start this diet. No, what I do is I take into consideration a person's goals, their unique circumstances, what, what they enjoy, and even their mental and their emotional thinking patterns as well. So all of these things really have an impact on a person's health. That's why we look at the whole person. I also want to figure out what is best for each person because each person is different. So what might work for one person may not work for someone else. So it's a really great opportunity to develop a, a personalized plan made just for them. So that's, that answers that question. Next question, what do you have to do to become a certified health coach and how long does it take? So there's quite a few different certification programs out there. I chose to do an online route, which was really neat and worked for the circumstance, my life circumstances at the time. And it took me about a year to get my certification. The same company that I went through, the same school that I went through, also offers a life coaching program, which I'm currently going through right now. So that's really exciting. And that way I'm able to further my education and help, help people even better. The cool thing about this, this um, career, is that I'm always learning new things. So even though I got certified and I went through that schooling, I am continually taking continuing education classes and always trying to learn and grow so I can better serve my clients. So who do you enjoy helping and how do you help them? So I specialize in working with women as Jennifer mentioned and I really enjoy working with women because I feel like there's a lot of pressure on women in today's society maybe to look a certain way and women also have so many responsibilities. There's so many moms out there who are trying to juggle taking care of their families with their own health. There's people, women who work full time. So it can really be a, a struggle for women to feel confident and to balance their health with other responsibilities that they have. So the awesome part about being a, a certified health coach is I get to see people achieving their goals. I get to see these amazing transformations take place and it's so rewarding and so beautiful. 
So then the part about how do you help them? So I created um, my own program. It's called the Confidence Camp. And it's basically everything to achieve the goal of whether you're looking to lose weight or just feel more confident. So I work with women um, through that. And we'll go through an education, like a curriculum that I've designed that educates women on nutrition and lifestyle habits that are important. And then I also work one-on-one -on -one with clients, coaching them individually, and then also in group settings. So it's a really nice program because we get the one-on-one -on -one support, but you also get like this feeling of camaraderie from the group and it's really motivating and we all get to learn from each other, which is really, really fun. So why is it important to have a certified health coach and how can it help people? So one of the main reasons it's important is because there is so much information out there. If you ever Google, you know, something about health, you're going to come up with 20 different answers to the same question. And it's really hard to know what's right and what's wrong. So a coach will help you filter through that information and then find what works best for you. The second reason is even if you know what you need to be doing, sometimes it can be really hard to implement those changes and turn them into a habit. So for example, we all know that exercising is good for us, but when it comes to actually doing it, that's another story sometimes. We don't always do it. And that's where I come, come in. I help people um, carry out those goals and turn them into habits. And then um, the third reason is coaches help people with all sorts of different things. It's not just, um, you know, weight loss, as I mentioned earlier, it's lifestyle changes. So sleeping better, managing stress, prioritizing self-care, which I know we'll get to talk about today. I'm excited about. Um, really quick, before we move on to the next question, Jennifer, are there any questions yet? Yeah, um, there's a lot of interest um, from the girls. They're asking a lot of questions, but I have a couple of, of, mm -hmm. about the things that you already addressed here. So one is, What's the difference between uh, a holistic health coach and a life coach? And um, what school did you go to specifically or, and are you going to now? And what age group do you normally work with? Okay, so the school I went to, we'll start there. It's called Health Coach Institute and it's online and that's where I'm doing, um, that's where I got my health coaching certification and also where I'm getting my life coaching certification. Um, the difference between, what was it? A health coach, a life coach. Was there another one? Yeah, just the two. Um, very similar in some aspects because we work with the whole body. However, health coaches do take more of an interest specifically with health. So um, as a health coach, I have more information on nutrition, more information on how to like balance people's blood sugar and things like that. Whereas typically life coaches, although they look at the whole person and work on habit change, they might not necessarily have the nutrition, the nutritional knowledge behind it. And then there was one more question or two more. What age group do you normally work with? What age group? Um, I work with adults. So I work with women over 18, but most of my clients are between probably 30 and 50 range. So okay. yeah, was there another one? Nope, that's, we'll, we'll okay. keep going. Okay, perfect. So next question. Lots of people are stressed in this time of COVID, red flag war warnings and other social issue issues. Why is it important to manage stress? So Put simply, when stress is left unmanaged, it can be really bad for our health, our weight, our energy levels, and it doesn't feel good. That way before, when you're really worried about something, it's not a good feeling. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit, a little story about me when I was probably, I think I was 17. I'm originally from Washington State, and at the time, my high school offered a program where I was able to get my associate's degree from a college while I was in high school. 
And I remember at the end of my first quarter in college, I had finals coming up for college and for high school. Um, I had a performance coming up in front of an audience and I had some stressful things going on with some friends at the time. And I didn't really know how to manage my stress. And my, I broke out in hives all over my body. It was like itchy. I don't know if you know what hives are. They're like little swollen bumps and they're itchy. And long story short, because I didn't know how to manage my stress, that's how my body reacted to it. So that's not necessarily a very common reaction, but again, everyone is different. So that's how my um, body handled it. But at that point, it was kind of a wake up call and a good reminder that I needed to learn how to manage my stress better. So that leads us into the next question. How does stress affect you physically and mentally? So it's again, different for different people, but there's a, these are the most common ways that we might see stress present itself. Maybe a headache, maybe our heart feels like it's racing, maybe our muscles are really tense, Sometimes if we are under too much stress, we can have a weakened immune system and it can even cause digestive issues. Sometimes for me, if I'm really nervous about something, I notice that the night before I get a stomach ache and that's because of stress. So mentally, that can look like brain fog and the inability to focus on something. I know that's a really big one for a lot of people. Maybe even in school, you've experienced this. If you're stressing or worrying about something else, it can be hard to focus on the task at hand. So how does stress affect women and men differently? So there's one main difference here on how uh, men and women handle stress. There's a chemical called oxytocin and women, when they're under stress, produce a lot more of it. Men do produce, but a very little amount of it. So men, when they're under stress, oftentimes you'll see more of a, it's called a flight or fight response, and they get really amped up. Whereas women, they're noticing that they often respond to stress in a tend and befriend response. So they tend to everyone around them. They're more prone to taking care of their families or their friends and making connections with people. And they think there's still a lot of studies underway, but one of the main reasons is because of that, that um, hormone difference. So what are some mental techniques that you teach to employ and reduce stress? Okay, so this is one of my favorite things to do. It's journaling. I don't know if I have any journalers out there, but I love it. It's become such a big part of my life and my routines. So this is such a, such a powerful tool because you can write down everything that's stressing you or bugging you, or maybe you're just worried about something and you can write it down. And that way you get it out of your brain. You can see it visually. And oftentimes it feels more manageable when you can see it on a list and you think, okay, I can do that. And then I like to make a plan of action to solve it. So if I'm worried about something tomorrow before I go to bed, I'll write it down and I'll say, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna do these three things to take care of that. And then I won't be stressed about it anymore. It'll be taken care of. So journaling is a really powerful, powerful tool. Gratitude journaling, is also very, very powerful because it helps us focus on what's going really good in our life, what, what we're grateful for, what are positives that are going on. So it reminds us that even though we're dealing with stressful circumstances and we have worrisome things going on in our life, we also have a lot of good things going on in our life. So that's a really nice reminder. The next um, tip would be to speak up and let people know what you need. Maybe that's a parent, maybe you feel like you need some more support in some aspect of your life. Maybe you're really stressed about homework and, and you need some help on it. It's important to speak up and calmly let people know what you need help on. The next point is taking care of yourself. So making sure you're getting enough sleep, 
making sure you're resting enough can be really important. And also make time for things that you enjoy. If you have hobbies that you really like to do, make time for those. Make sure you're, you're allowing yourself time to, you know, hang out with friends and paint if you like painting, whatever that is, make time for things that you enjoy. And then the final point that I have on here is talk to someone that you trust. So talk to a parent, talk to a trusted adult. If you're feeling really stressed out about something, it can't hurt. They're just going to help and they'll be really appreciative that you went and talked to them as well. Okay, Jennifer, any questions for me? Yes, we, uh, first of all, we have a lot of girls out here who like to journal. So, um, so we have a lot of people who journal every day and, um, and many girls who draw as well for their stress relief. So that's good. That's awesome. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, one question is, since people are so different, is it hard to determine how to help each individual person and how do you determine how to proceed? That is a really good question. I like that. Um, yes, it can be challenging at times, but typically there's a couple questions. I'll talk to the person and I'll draw them out and Although stress can present itself differently, a lot of times people realize that they are going through stressful times or they realize that there's something in their life that's stressing them out. So when I talk with people one-on-one, -on -one, they usually share that with me. And then from there, we can go in and look and see how is it affecting them? Is this affecting their sleep? Is it affecting how much they eat? Maybe they're eating way too much. Maybe they're eating not enough. So it's really, that's kind of the starting point. When someone's going through a stressful spot, we can start there and then, then work to figure out how it's playing out in their life. I hope that answers their question. So another question they had is, does fear directly cause stress? Good question also. Um, it can, yes, definitely. Um, that's where that term fight or flight comes in. So originally, it's like imagine if a bear was chasing you, they give this example a lot. That's the type of stress. So if a bear was chasing us, we'd feel really stressed out. And what happens is our body starts releasing stress hormones and our blood goes to like our arms and our legs because it's preparing us to fight, fight a bear off. <laughs> so even though that's not a very common problem anymore today, we don't have many wild animals chasing us typically, um, our body still reacts the same way. So that's kind of the crazy thing is even if there is, you know, some sort of scary thing that's happening or even a stressful thing, our body reacts in that same way, which is why it's so important to manage it. Because if it's left unchecked and we feel that way for a really, really long time, it's not good for us. So to answer the question, yes, fear and stress, very similar response. And then, um, and then there, you, you did touch on this. You said, um, if you're feeling stressed, you should reach out to a parent or a trusted adult. And I don't know who said it, but somebody um, wrote, a, wrote a comment here and said, my parents are busy. Who else can I talk to? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I don't know the situation, obviously. Sometimes parents need to be asked, hey, can you take a, a few minutes to talk to me? But if that's really not possible, is there an aunt, someone else that you trust, or a school counselor, or I don't know how things um, are organized in the Girl Scouts, but someone, maybe a, a leader that they could reach out to and, and express what they're going through. That's a great, that's a great, that's great advice. All right, so um, I know that you're gonna talk about exercise and stress in a little while. So we'll just, uh, we'll take a break on questions and have you keep going. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so next question. What are some breathing techniques that you teach and employ to reduce stress? So for this one, we can do it all together. We'll do a little breathing exercise. So oftentimes when we're going about our day and we're really busy, we tend to take really short, shallow breaths. 
and that can prevent us from getting enough oxygen and it can make us feel anxious and it can really zap our energy. So we can even feel really tired when this happens too. So if you girls are ready, we can go and do a, a breathing exercise together. So you can get really comfortable. When you do this in the future, you're welcome to lay down on your bed or on a couch, but I think most of you are probably in chairs right now like I am. So just get really comfortable and just take a deep breath. Now we're just gonna start paying attention to where our breathing is at. So mine's a little short right now because I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna breathe in through your nose and then out through your nose. And go ahead and place one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly and breathe in through your nose and out through your nose. As you, you can keep breathing, just take deep breaths in and deep breaths out. And as you breathe in, feel your belly rise and fall as you breathe. You can feel your chest rise a little bit as you breathe in and then it falls again as you breathe out. I like to imagine that there's a balloon in my belly. And as I breathe in, it inflates nice and big. And as I breathe out, it deflates. Okay, so let's take three more deep breaths together. In and out and one more. Okay. Sarah, can you hear me? Okay. So it looks like Sarah is frozen and hopefully um, her computer, um, she's probably re trying to reboot her computer. So just give her a second guys. Um, Courtney, can you just make sure that you uh, let her back in? Yes. <laughs> yes, no problem. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you love this meeting. Thank you for the feedback. That's great. I appreciate it. She'll come back. Let's see what we got here. No luck, Courtney? I have not seen her yet. Um, it would be, she'd be right at the top because uh, right now nobody's in the waiting room. So it's, um, it'll be obvious when she pops back in. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So I guess her, her face went away, right? Yes, yeah, it closed down completely. Okay. I'm assuming that she's trying to get back in. She says, I don't know. She's trying to get back in right now, Courtney. Okay. Nobody in the waiting room just yet. Okay, she just texted me. Okay. So everybody give me a thumbs up if they like what they're hearing so far. Good, excellent. 
Ooh, lots of thumbs up. Excellent. Let's see here. Any, any luck, Courtney? Not yet. Okay. Oh, here she is. Perfect. She's on her way. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. We can't see you. Hmm. Oh, yeah. I, see, I see her. Yeah, see you'll you. have to change it to speaker view because now she's probably near the bottom. Yep. Got it. Okay. I had to for some reason it quit working on my computer, so I'm coming in on my iPad. I can hear and see her. Can you see her? If you put it on speaker view, you should be able to see yes. her. Yeah, I can see her. Okay. Okay. Let's see. How can I do this here? Maybe we'll turn it this way. Miss Sarah? Yes. yes. So do you help people mentally and physically? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm, my, I'm by no means a therapist or anything like that, but definitely in achieving goals and developing healthier habits, there's definitely improvements mentally for a lot of people. Okay, so does everything look good? Yeah, everything looks great. And Courtney, why don't you go ahead and mute everybody again, and then Sarah can unmute herself. Okay, so where did I cut out at? <laughs> the breathing part. Okay. Okay, so I think we finished up that breathing technique then. So uh, we'll move on. The other breathing technique that I really like, you can start off doing what we just did, taking the deep breaths in and out. But I like to think of myself as when I take a deep breath in, I think of all the calm things. I think of all the good things that are going on in my life. And as I breathe out, I like to imagine myself releasing all of my tension and stress. So that's another technique that you can try. How does, next question, how does what you eat affect stress levels? So when we're not eating high quality foods or when we're not eating enough food, it can send our, our body on kind of a, I call it the blood sugar roller coaster. So if we aren't eating good food and maybe we are just eating a bag of Sour Patch Kids, it's gonna shoot our body on a up, our blood sugar up, and then it's gonna drop down again. And then when it's really low, we want to get more energy. So we eat more candy and it goes up again. <laughs> That's not really good. And that can cause a lot of stress on our body. So instead of eating just sugar or really low quality foods, processed carbs and foods, it's important that we're eating really high quality foods. We're getting good protein, we're getting good fats, um, complex carbs, high quality carbs, and that's going to help our, our blood sugar stay really level. And sometimes when our blood sugar is not level, that's when we experience maybe mood swings or more anxiety, or we get really crabby and irritated. <laughs> that's typically what's going on. So, um, really quick, Jennifer, are there any questions before I go on? She's muted. I can't hear you. Sorry about that. I was <laughs> muted. Thank you for telling me. So somebody was asking about how eating fat and protein versus processed sugars, how that affects your 
um, stress level and your whole health? Yeah, good question. So um, put really simply, fat and sugar is a long-term energy source. So our body, if we eat, um, let's say we eat the Sour Patch Kids, our body's gonna burn through it really fast. And we feel that sugar high and we feel really good for a little bit. And then we feel really, we have a sugar crash. <laughs> then we feel really tired. Whereas if we eat, let's say um, some chicken, that's some good quality protein, then our body can use that for a long time. So it's gonna burn through the chicken a lot slower than it's gonna burn through the simple sugars or the simple carbs. And same with fat too, high quality fat, it's just a long-term energy source. So instead of shooting our blood sugar up really quick, it's gonna keep it more level. Okay, hey, we'll keep on going. Okay, let's see. Next question, why do people eat when they are stressed and why is this bad? So yes, good question. I know it's a really common term, stress eating. And maybe some of you guys have experienced it, um, but there's a really, there's a couple main reasons. The first reason is food makes us feel good. When we eat food that we like, it makes us feel good. We all enjoy eating, right? I know I love eating. <laughs> so food makes us feel really good. So if we're stressed and we have other aspects of our life that we don't, that we, that aren't going as good, oftentimes we're gonna find comfort in eating food. The second reason, and I know this is really true for me, is sometimes we use food as a distraction. So when I was in school and I used to have homework and projects due, I remember I'd go and I'd sit in my room and I'd work for a couple minutes and then I'd get bored and I didn't wanna keep doing it. So I'd walk out into the kitchen, I'd grab some snacks, I'd eat a little bit and it was a constant cycle. So oftentimes we just use it to distract ourselves. Maybe we don't wanna deal with a certain problem. So this gives us something else to do. Another um, way affect, uh, another way stress might affect how we eat is something that I like to call um, happy eating. <laughs> so some people are happy eaters, which is not bad, but what can happen is some people when they feel really stressed, then they don't eat enough food. And I struggle with that when I'm stressed or I'm nervous about something. It's like food gets put on the back burner and I, I don't think about it as much. And I don't really have as much of an appetite sometimes. Um, but really, that's not a good thing because we need food, we need energy. And especially in times of stress, we need to make sure we're eating enough food so that way we can handle and manage our stress better. It'll give us the energy to do so. So let's see, next question. What else can you do when you feel that the need to eat when you are stressed? So when you feel this way, you want to try to get to the root of the problem. You can ask yourself, why am I eating right now? Am I hungry? Do I feel hungry? Or am I bored? Or maybe do I want a distraction? So getting to the root and figuring out why you're eating can be really important. And if you are hungry, even if you're stressed, if you are hungry, maybe your tummy's growling, maybe it's dinner time, you definitely should eat. Make a meal and in, enjoy it. So one difference though that we'll notice is instead of snacking all day, it can be really beneficial to make a meal and to sit down maybe with your family and really enjoy that meal. And you're paying attention to it. You're, you're eating mindfully instead of just without paying attention and because you're bored or distracted. So if you are experiencing a lot of stress and you are hungry, definitely eat. That's very important. Enjoy your meal. Um, other things that aren't food related is one of my favorites is to do some stretching or take a walk around the block. Maybe if you have animals, play with your animals. But when you realize that you are stress eating or you're, I call it bored eating, <laughs> We all do that, I think. 
it can be good to find something else to do instead of that. So look for um, something else that you enjoy or do something productive. If you have homework, say, okay, I'm going to set my timer for, you know, 15 minutes and I'm going to work on my homework. And then once it's up, I'm going to do some stretches. So other than eating, what are other ways women and girls negatively react to stress and anxiety? So I think a lot of times we see kind of a um, perfectionist mentality. We, we tend to look at what we're missing or what we're not doing. And in reality, we want to focus on what we are doing really good. So instead of um, beating ourselves up and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not doing this and this right, or I have this to do, um, it can be really important to just say, wow, okay, these are the things that I am doing really well. And, and the fact is, is none of us are perfect. We don't do everything perfectly. So reminding ourselves that, just say, I'm doing the best I can. And, and that's all we can do is really, we have to give it our best, but we aren't expected to be perfect. Another, reason, another way we see um, maybe a negative reaction to stress would be overscheduling. So if you're maybe in school and you're really, really, really busy and you're always going, it's important to make sure that you have some time to rest and relax and, and be realistic about what you can do. So just be really balanced and, and make sure that you do have some time to rest. And like we talked about earlier, some other tips to manage stress. Make sure you are, are scheduling in some time for that. And again, some people, when they're stressed, they keep it all to themselves. They keep it inside. Like we talked about earlier, talk to someone. Go talk to a trusted adult, um, friends. That can be really beneficial and really important. So what are ways that women and girls react positively to stress? This is an awesome question because stress isn't always bad. When left unmanaged, it can be a bad thing, but some levels of stress are totally normal. For example, let's say it's your first day back to school, or maybe you have some public speaking assignment, or maybe you're making new friends. All of those things you can be nervous about. It's normal to feel nervous. That is totally normal to feel stressed about a certain situation. Um, one way that you can react really positively to stress is by exercising. This is a really great way to get out some of your pent up energy, to get some nerves out and to still do something really beneficial and, um, and good for your body. And it, it does help relieve stress. Plus you're doing this really awesome, fun, beneficial thing. Um, sometimes when I feel stressed, I love dancing. And my husband and I used to go out dancing. We did some swing dancing and salsa, but now since shelter in place, I play just dance in my living room. But it's fun and I get out my energy. So find some sort of movement that you enjoy. Maybe it's dancing, maybe it's going for a hike or going running or playing with your friends outside. Find something that you enjoy doing. Okay, any questions, Jennifer? So um, I, we do have a couple questions, but before we address the questions, I am getting a, quite a few reports from um, the girls that somebody was um, sending them messages and uh, distracting them. So we have removed one of the girls from the meeting because she wasn't um, acting uh, respectful. And so, um, so we're going to do that. So just know that if you don't want to be here, just go ahead and exit, but don't bother your other Girl Scout sisters, please. All right. So um, with that said, um, uh, Sarah, one of the girls asks, um, if you can't manage your stress level, do sometimes people get put on medications for that? Definitely, yeah. Um, again, it's not, that's kind of out of my zone of genius that's not within my expertise um, but my advice would be do everything you can put in the 
the techniques, the tips that I've shared even today to help manage your stress and talk with people. And I'm sure that that's a decision that you and your parents and probably a, a doctor or a therapist would have to make in regards to that. Beautiful answer. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. Okay. So next question, how does stress affect sleep? What happens when you don't get enough sleep? And what other things happen to your body when you are sleep deprived? Okay, so stress definitely can have a negative impact on sleep. So just like if that bear was chasing you, like we talked about earlier, you probably wouldn't feel like going to take a nap at that point, right? <laughs> if a wild animal was chasing you. So it's that same kind of response. When we feel stress, um, there's a stress hormone called cortisol, and it's responsible for that, that response, that feeling of fight or flight, and it gives us kind of a jolt of energy, which when we're trying to go to sleep, energy is not really what we're looking for at that time. So stress can definitely affect sleep. One of my favorite tools is the journaling, like I mentioned earlier, before I go to bed. Because sometimes when I get ready to go to sleep, I have all of these thoughts going through my head and it's really beneficial to write them down on paper and to make a plan of action for the next day. That way they're out of my mind and I can sleep good that night. Um, let's see, next, the, what was the second part? Oh, what happens when you don't get enough sleep? Well, it's kind of a vicious cycle because when you don't sleep enough, then you feel more stressed too. And then when you feel more stressed, then it's hard to sleep. So it's very important to uh, work on managing that stress. And a couple of the other things that happen when we're not getting enough sleep is we can be really drowsy, maybe really tired and low energy. Maybe we're really irritable. We get irritated at other people quickly and easily. Maybe we have a really hard time concentrating or remembering things if we're not sleeping very well. And it can even affect our appetite. We might have a lack of appetite if we're not getting enough sleep. So those could all be signs that you're not sleeping enough. I take time before I go to bed each night. I call it my power down hour. And I take time without screens. I put away, I put my phone in the other room. I listen to some really calming music. I light a candle, I do my journaling, and all of these steps help me calm down, help me not feel stressed before I go to bed, and that way I can sleep better. And it's a time of my day that I really look forward to each, each day because I know I'll feel really relaxed when I'm done. So that brings us to our next question. What foods help you sleep better? So when we have a diet that is full of healthy fats and protein and high quality carbs and fiber, we're more likely to get a good night's sleep. There's um, an amino acid, it's called tryptophan, and it's found in foods like different nuts like almonds and walnuts, it's found in bananas, it's found in milk and honey, and also in um, chicken and turkey, so some poultry. And this amino acid has been proven to help us sleep better. So some of those foods can be really beneficial to eat before bed. But ultimately, if we're eating a, a diet that's really balanced and we're getting enough protein and fat, then that's going to have the biggest impact on our sleep. So if you've been having trouble sleeping, or maybe in the future you experience some issues sleeping, you might wanna try eating something before bed, like maybe a whole grain piece of toast with some almond butter and bananas on it. I love that snack, that's really good. Also, um, avoiding caffeine. I know like some things, even certain soda pops like Pepsi or Coca-Cola have caffeine in them. And when we drink those, especially later in the day, it can help us not sleep very good. Okay, next question. Why is water important and how much? I love this question because I'm kind of a water addict. 
<laughs> my husband makes fun of me because I constantly have my water bottle with me. So the reason water is so important is because our bodies are made up of up to 60% of our body is water. Isn't that crazy? 60% of our body. So water is needed to um, help regulate our body temperature. It keeps our organs functioning properly. It protects our tissues and our joints. It helps us digest the food that we eat and it helps us get rid of toxins in our body. So some signs that you might not be drinking enough water. This one's kind of gross ladies, but it's probably the best way to tell. If your pee is really dark yellow or maybe orangish, orangish color and it smells, that could very well be a sign that you're dehydrated. Another sign would be low energy. Maybe you're feeling really tired. If that's the case, ask yourself, how much water have I drank today? Have I drank enough? It's a good way to check in. Another sign might be dry skin or chapped lips because if we're not getting enough water, our skin, which is mostly water, could be a little bit dry. So how much water should you be drinking? So we're gonna do a little math problem here. <laughs> the simple way is whatever you weigh, you cut that number in half, and then that's how many ounces you want to drink a day. So for example, I weigh about 150 pounds. So how much water do I wanna drink? Well, I'm gonna cut that number in half. So that's 75. I see 185, close. There we go, <laughs> some 75s. <laughs> and I wanna drink at least 75 ounces of water a day. Now, if you're exercising and you're sweating a lot, you might wanna drink a little bit more. Or if you're out in the sun all day and you're sweating, you wanna drink a little bit more water. And um, it's fun if you have like a really cool water bottle that you like. I have a hydro flask and it has my stickers all over it and it makes me want to drink water more. So that's a fun little, a fun little tip. If you're trying to drink more water, you can use a water bottle that you really like and it makes it, it, makes it funner to drink your water. <laughs> Okay, any questions, Jennifer? No, everybody's just commenting on how much water they drink and they were trying to do the math along with you. And <laughs> <laughs> Awesome job. Yeah, nice. yeah, a lot of participation, so that's cute. Good, good. <laughs> okay, so next question. How does eating by color help one stay healthy? So this is a really kind of fun topic. So basically when we're eating fruits and vegetables, obviously there's all sorts of different, different colored fruits and vegetables. And the cool thing about that is different colors contain different nutrients and different antioxidants. So the nutrients that might be found in a yellow squash might be different than what's found in a red bell pepper or an orange. So it's really important when we're looking at like our fruits and vegetables, we wanna eat a variety of colors. You can eat the rainbow. Um, you pick all sorts of different colors. So the main color groups, we have white. So that would be like mushrooms, cauliflower. Then you have red, purple, and blue. So think about all the different berries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, along with vegetables as well, red bell peppers. Um, then you have your oranges and yellows and your greens. So you want to try to eat a variety of different fruits and veggies. I said, just saw one comment come through that says, I love veggies and fruits. That is awesome. <laughs> Keep it up and, and think about how many different colors you get to eat. And yes, bananas, those would be in the, in the yellow category. <laughs> okay, so next question, how does society and the media cause women and girls to become stressed through their messaging? So this is a really great question and it's really applicable today. So the media oftentimes tells us that we need to look a certain way. Um, it shows pictures of photoshopped models and they always look perfect. And it's interesting um, 
I read an article, it says that the media has a hard time showing what a normal girl looks like. So many studies have been shown that what we see in the media has been linked to low self-esteem, eating disorders, and even poor body image. So it can feel really stressful and we might feel a lot of pressure to look a certain way and to, to look like the girls and the women that we see in the media. So even though we feel this pressure to maybe perfect our appearance, we have to remember that a lot of this is not realistic. Many of the pictures are photoshopped. They have, you know, professional makeup artists and hair people, and many of them have had cosmetic surgery. And not that there's anything wrong with wearing makeup or, you know, doing your nails. I wear makeup. Um, but we have to be balanced about what we expect. So, you know, we just don't want to stress too much over how we look. And we want to keep in mind that what we see on the news or in the media or maybe on social media, maybe um, influencers on Instagram, a lot of times what we see is not real life. We always see the best parts of, of what people are showing us. And in reality, each one of us has really pretty moments in our life and we all have not so pretty moments in our life. So when on social media, we tend to only see those pretty moments. So we just wanna keep in mind that everyone, no one's perfect and we all have um, really good things in our life and not so good things. That's, that's being human. <laughs> So how do we learn to look for cues so that we are not as easily affected by this messaging? So one really great tip is notice how you're feeling when you're looking at certain things. So maybe you're scrolling through Instagram and you find an account of an influencer and maybe they're pushing a certain appearance. Maybe they're pushing um, a diet or, you know, certain things notice how you're feeling. If that doesn't make you feel good, there is nothing wrong with unfollowing people, muting people. Um, that's really important that we, if we're noticing those things, someone pushing certain appearances, that maybe we take a break and we decide to unfollow them because we have to choose what we see. And, and that's a really powerful thing is we get to choose that. We get to choose on Instagram who we look at. So if there's someone out there who's not making you feel good about yourself, then there's nothing wrong with unfollowing them. Okay, any questions? Yeah, um, so they wanted um, you to go over the calculation on how much water to consume in a day again. They, they really wanted to do that. And, and why don't we do this? Why don't you send me a quick little note after this and I'll include it in the follow-up email so that they have it in their files. Okay, so perfect. So if you can verbally tell them one more time and then email it to me and then we can make sure that we get that to them because it sounds like it's important to people. Yes, yeah, sounds good. So it's your weight. So when you step on a scale, whatever you weigh and you divide it in half. So we can do another example here. Let's say you weigh a hundred pounds how many ounces of water do we want to drink? So we, I, see, I see quite a few right answers rolling in. So we want to cut that number in half and that number is 50. So we want to drink 50 ounces of water at least every day. And let's do another one. Okay, what if you weigh 108 pounds? How many ounces of water do you want to drink every day? 54. 54, man, these girls are smart. Nice, good job guys. Okay, so does that make, make more sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I have a question, it's kind of random, but can anger make you more stressed if you're already stressed? Yes, it can. Yep, that's a good question, but yes, anger, and, and stress can definitely make you feel more stressed. So, and when you, when you feel really stressed, sometimes you tend to get angrier at people or you're more likely to feel that way, feel angry. So some of those tips that I shared to manage stress, like um, journaling, 
or those breathing techniques are really good when you're feeling angry. Go lay down on your bed and just take a few minutes and do some breathing techniques that can be really beneficial for stress and for anger. Um, Miss Sarah, I have a question. Yes. Um, so can sleep paralysis um, affect your next day? I'm sure it can. I'll be honest with you, that's not my expertise. I don't know a ton about sleep paralysis. I haven't um, worked with anyone who's experienced that, but I'm sure that if you're having any issue sleeping, that can definitely affect um, your day because you're not getting good sleep. Okay, girls, girls, remember your questions need to go in the Zoom chat, okay? So everybody keep themselves on mute. Put your questions in Zoom chat, please. So go ahead, Miss Sarah. Okay, so I think we're on to our, our last couple questions here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about self-talk um, that will reduce stress and anxiety. So I'm gonna tell you guys my story. When I was probably in middle school, I got into a really bad habit of some negative self-talk. So I would look in the mirror and I'd say things like, oh, I'm so ugly, or I'm so fat. And I would say those things to myself all day. Every time I would step in front of a mirror, I would say that to myself. And it really had a negative effect on how I viewed myself. Um, so it took me actually quite a few years to overcome that. And I don't struggle with it anymore. I've worked really hard to change those habits. But if that's something that you struggle with, it's really important when you find yourself doing that, when you find yourself saying mean things to yourself, you can pause. And I like to ask myself, would I say this to my friend? Would I tell my friend you're ugly? Or would I tell my friend you're fat? No, I would be so mean. But I would tell myself that. So that's kind of a good um, gauge. If you wouldn't tell your friend that, you might not want to tell yourself that because we want to treat ourselves with kindness. We want to be, you know, compassionate and kind to our own bodies because in reality, we're all beautiful. We all have amazing bodies, you know, these gifts that we allow us to go hiking and do all sorts of cool things, spend time with friends. So really focusing on the positive. Um, so once, you know, if you catch yourself saying those things to yourself, you can pause and, and try to think of a positive thing to tell yourself like, oh, I really like my hair today. Or, you know, I'm really grateful for my legs because they took me on a hike with my family. So that's a really easy way and fun way to kind of reframe it. And it, even if it sounds kind of funny, I promise it works. I've used it and that has really helped me a lot. So that's, um, just a really, a really nice, nice tool. And then our last question here is about the benefits of starting a journal. So it sounds like we already have a lot of journalers here in the house. That's awesome. Um, if you haven't started a journal yet, I definitely encourage you to do so. It's really good to keep track of things like exercise or stress or sleep, it can kind of give you an overview of how you've been feeling health-wise. And um, it's also another great tool for dealing with stress like we talked about earlier and also dealing with negative self-talk. If we're feeling certain ways, it's really nice to write it out on paper and journal through it and, and help yourself really realize what you are feeling. So I definitely encourage starting a journal for sure. Okay, any other questions, Jennifer? Um, you know what, I think that that is it. Um, unfortunately, we had a bunch of people that have been emailing me and saying that they couldn't get in for some oh. odd reason. So fortunately, this is going to be recorded or it is being recorded. So we'll send it out to those folks who didn't get to join us today. But this was okay. really amazing. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time. And I know that you are going to um, send everybody a link so they can get a special journal sheet for you from you, right? 
Yes, I created um, a journal sheet. So it's something that you can do every day. There's a couple simple questions there, but it's really going to help with managing stress and making a plan for your day. So there will be a link to that. And then eventually at some point I'm working on creating a journal. Um, so it'll have, it'll be like for a couple months each day, there will be really cool activities. It'll have some gratitude journaling in there, um, some food journaling in there. So I'm really excited for that too. Okay. It looks like you have a question, Bethany. Do you? Um, no, it's a comment. Okay. Go ahead, honey. So whenever you do anything, will it ever affect you? Sorry. I can say it again. Oh. So if you do anything that's harmful to your feelings, will it affect you? Oh, forever? Okay, so like it, I think what you're asking is like, if you say mean things to yourself, is that what you're talking about? Will it affect it you? Okay, well, definitely. I mean, when you're doing that, like for me, um, I just really didn't feel good about myself. I had a hard time making friends. I had a hard time, um, you know, going and shopping for clothes because I didn't like trying anything on because I really hated how I looked. Um, so it does affect you definitely, you know, in the moment and it can have long-term effects if we let that thinking take over. So that's why it's really important, especially, you know, for you guys, you're younger, this is a great opportunity to start that now, to start noticing how you're thinking and to really, really try to, say positive things to yourself. Perfect. That's a, that's a great way, a great note to end on, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I know ladies that we ran a little bit late, but we appreciate you hanging in there and, um, and staying to the end. Uh, it was all val valuable information. Lots of gratitude in the chat box, Miss Sarah, uh -huh. lots of thank yous, lots of you made a difference. Um, so, um, so very, very helpful to all of the girls. So thank you on behalf of the girls and Girl Scouts for giving us your time this afternoon. Of and course. Thank you for having me. I was so happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're the lucky ones. So, so girls, uh, you look for a follow-up email on this event and um, you'll be able to watch it again if, on the um, link that we send out if you're interested. So have a great and healthy weekend, and we'll see y'all later. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.